admit I'm in a bit of a pickle here. The goal of Movies with Mikey is and will continue to be a comedic celebration of film, never resorting to nitpicking every last detail in a movie to get laughs. Not that I have a problem with that. I love Cinema Sins or Red Letter Media on Mr. Plinkett. The pickle comes not with the film trailers in question, but with some of the responses to them. By now, pretty much everyone with a heartbeat and a connection to the internet is aware that the Jurassic World and Star Wars Episode 7 trailers released last week, four days apart. Since there's already more fan parodies of the trailers on YouTube than there were the total number of videos during the the entire first year of YouTube. Fact made up and not checked. I just want to discuss some of the ways different people react to things they love. Some could say maybe we love some of this stuff too much. Let's dive into Jurassic World first. I love Jurassic Park. It's maybe not a great fit for movies with Mikey because I don't think I can bring a whole lot to the table there, but here's a few things that were certainly overlooked by the time we got to the third film. Oh, the third one. Jurassic Park may not be the most complex construction in the world, but simplicity executed well is quite potent. For the danger of a film to resonate with an audience you need two things. One, a new form of danger or a new take on an existing idea of danger. In this case, we got the best look at dinosaurs in the history of cinema. It's so good that 22 years on, this is still true. That's pretty remarkable when you think about it. Two, characters and arcs for those characters that we care about. Alan Grant, Ellie Sattler, Lex, Tim, Ian mother and Malcolm. Hammond, Muldoon, Nedry, Arnold, Gennaro, the character where Happy becomes T-Rex Alpo. Ellie wants kids, but Grant doesn't. This is exemplified when he threatens a child at the beginning of the film with a raptor claw in the most inappropriate way. I also, maybe the kid is Benjamin Button because he hasn't aged a day since the movie came out. By putting Grant in charge of keeping the children safe during the course of the film, he has personal growth that allows him to see value in raising a family with Sattler. This also allows an audience to cheer for the kids instead of rolling their eyes when they do gymnastics and doc rap rider wizards go the fourth Jurassic Park film has been in the works for a long time, well over a decade now. I'm actually amazed something was finally made. That in and of itself is a miracle. Here's just a sampling of the history of this film. In November of 2002, Steven Spielberg announced that the development of a fourth Jurassic Park film had begun and that William Monaghan was working on the screenplay. I was pretty elated. He was and still is one of my favorite writers ever. He wrote Kingdom of Heaven, The Departed, Edge of Darkness during Mel Gibson's crazy years. And the development of this was far enough along that in 2003, Stan Winston had even announced that his studio had started designing creatures for it. This thing was all over the place for the next few years. In 2004, Alex Proyas, director of The Crow, Dark City, and I, Robot, was allegedly in talks to take over for Joe Johnson in the director's chair. They were even talking about building this massive water tank at Pinewood Studios for filming underwater scenes with aquatic dinosaurs. Jeremy Piven and Emmy Rossum were being considered for roles, but later Alex Proyas dropped out. This is also after John Sayles, writer of E.T. and Apollo 13, had taken over the scripting duties for Monaghan. In August of 2004, the Harry Knowles website around Ain't It Cool News obtained a leaked draft of the in-development screenplay revealing, and this is an actual quote, a dirty dozen style mercenary team of hyper smart dinosaurs in body armor killing drug dealers and rescuing kidnapped children. I, I, it didn't get made for you know, probably that. There's a million more developments along the way, but let's just skip ahead. On March 14th, 2013, Colin Trevorrow was announced as the director of Jurassic World, for real this time. Up to this point, he's only made one small indie feature, Safety Not Guaranteed, which is yeah, it's pretty great, uh, but that was it, and he did. He did what a sizable cross-section of Hollywood elite were unable to do. He actually made the damn thing. When I first watched the trailer, I really liked all the nods to the first film. The truck tour across the field that recreates Grant, Lex, and Tim's running from the flocking Gallimimas. The crazy gyrosphere that's just like the Jeeps looking up from under the Brachiosaurs. Some people took a big nasty poop on the gyrosphere, but I think it's actually a pretty cool piece of technology because a 40-ton dinosaur could step on it and it wouldn't break. You know, unlike a Jeep. Clever girl. For the most part, Jurassic World looks like a theme park where people can come and experience the terrors that people experienced when Jurassic Park went down. Possibly as if the events of the first film were made into their own film within the Jurassic Park universe. That's super meta. Ah. We can see that they worked out the kinks that caused the park to fail in the first place. Of course, the only actual flaw that caused Jurassic Park to turn into an all-you-can-eat dinosaur buffet was giving a disgruntled, greedy sack of human garbage the ability to shut down all the fences in the park without authorization. Probably not too hard to, to fix. Oh, look at that, it's fixed. <laughs> and then there were a lot of reactions to the trailer, which is fun. We like discussing things we love and trying to figure out what's going on. Some of the more common criticisms I saw. Do we really need another Jurassic Park film? No, 
We don't. Then again, films are not oxygen, shelter, food, or water, so we don't actually need movies at all either. We just like them. They're fun. And this looks like it could be fun. It's got Turbo Pratt rocking a dirt bike with a team of trained raptors. Man, I'm game. There's too much CGI. I agree, the trailer has a lot of computer-generated effects in it, and much of the strength of the original film was traditional animatronic effects by Stan Winston's masterful studio. And this was obviously super easy to miss, but the park has a restaurant named after him, so at least the people working on it want to celebrate his legacy. And I think the over-reliance on CGI might actually just be the trailer. Something we saw long before anything else in the film was a picture of a practical raptor in a massive workshop. Trevorrow is using practical effects in the film and wanted to talk about them. So maybe it's safe to believe that the film film won't have the same heavy reliance on CGI that the trailer does. Like we're pointing out things that the people making it are already aware of because they released a photo addressing the concerns five months ago? Just thinking out loud here. Why would they genetically modify and create an entirely new dinosaur? That always goes wrong. True, but the film needs conflict. Whether or not we'll agree with the way the conflict is addressed in the film remains to be seen, but it probably wouldn't be a very exciting movie if everyone was happy and nothing went wrong. What assuaged my own fears with this particular issue was seeing that my man B.D. Wong is back as Dr. Henry Wu. He's rad, and of all the characters to bring back, I'm pleased to see they brought him back in what is hopefully a larger role. He was a trustworthy character in 1993, and I hope they use that to build a rapport with the audience. Just don't use the DNA of spontaneously gender-swapping West African frogs this time. Maybe. I don't know. There's not a lot I really have left to say about the movie. It's exciting to see that after such a long and difficult history in getting another Jurassic Park film made, they finally succeeded. It's perfectly reasonable to be skeptical, but it's also reasonable to hope that the final result is something special that justifies it being made in the first place. You know, like... Turbo Pratt and the Raptor Squad. <sighs> okay, Star Wars. This has to be so difficult because Star Wars is a juggernaut of modern culture. It's simply too big for a result where everyone is happy. When Disney bought Star Wars from George Lucas and announced that they were making episodes through nine, for a fleeting moment, we were all happy together. And then they announced that J.J. Abrams was directing it. The Jage, Wednesdays this fall. When J.J. made the Star Trek reboot, there were a lot of criticisms that he was trying to turn Star Trek into Star Wars. Which makes sense because he did turn something that was more about working through complex ethical issues aboard a starship into something more space adventure -y. He's also a huge fan of Star Wars. Of all the criticisms that could be leveled against him as a filmmaker, building an incredibly polished package of direction, cinematography, and practical effects isn't one of them. There were a lot of things that I think didn't work out so well with Into Darkness, but every single one of those was due to the script, not the direction. On this film, Episode 7, Abrams worked with Lawrence Kasdan on the script. Dude wrote Empires. So that's all I need to know that that this movie is in the best possible hands it could be. And I think that's why I wanted to make this episode. It's not in our hands. No matter how much we might love something, that doesn't mean we have ownership over it. There's a lot to take in in that 88 seconds. New characters, X-Wings flying at super low altitudes in the atmosphere, new stormtroopers, and really the only returning character is this dizzying, joyful, excitement-inducing magic, you know, of the Falcon fighting TIE fighters also at super low altitudes. There's really no reason to be doing these fan-edited fixing of the trailer because we don't even know what we're taking out or changing because we know literally nothing about this film. You can't fix something if you don't know what it is. In lieu of that, here are the things that may be absurdly happy that were in this trailer. This is clearly a story about new characters embarking on their own adventures interacting with the aftermath of episode 4 through 6. Abrams wants to take familiar elements from the original trilogy and show us what they can do in new ways. Sure, Luke took his X-Wing down to Dagobah, but we never saw anyone doing this Top Gun shit 10 feet off the surface of a lake. The more I think about this, the more awesome it is. Up until now, the only people ever to witness the crazy space battles in Star Wars were the pilots. Abrams has brought these elements into our reality. Can you imagine if a person in a bad situation, say, John Boyega's character, was running through the desert and looked up and saw this? That's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It made me sweaty and uneasy. I'll be in my bunk! All of the stormtroopers are different heights. There's people other than John Boyega in these costumes. Real, actual people. Also, that new helmet looks incredible in motion. I love it. Mm. Much ballyhoo has been made about the new lightsaber. That's kind of genius, actually. There's no way that they didn't know it was going to spark intense debate on the internet. There's more reactions to this than practically anything else in the trailer. 
I'm not even sure how even I feel about it, but there's a lot of speculation that everyone can partake in, which I'm positive was 100% of the reason they put it there in such blatant fashion. It's a clever two-stage setup, one that I'm sad I didn't get to see in a theater. Just walking all casual through this forest, then I'm like, blomp, no big, just kidding, second blomp. Theater goes nuts. I'm not even sure what to call it. Is it like a light claymore? What we for sure don't know is what the function of it is in the universe. It's iconic as all hell. If it fulfills a specific need, say, being in a situation like this, you could just go, bomp, goodbye. We can all sit around and say, I would have designed it differently, but without knowing what the story function that necessitated the design being made in such a way, we're then redesigning something with absolutely zero of the parameters. The trailer did exactly what it was supposed to do. It sent the internet into a frenzy of speculation and discussion, diving into every frame for clues as to what we're in store for. Star Wars is something many people have a deep, meaningful connection with. It's been a road with many highs and lows, possibly the number of disappointments outweigh the number of successes, but the heights that Star Wars as a film universe have taken us to will never be pulled down by the less beloved entries in the franchise. Kinda looking at you, Dexter Jetster. Come on, man. Take a shower. I know that the people making the film have their hearts in the right place. They want to do right by the fans, and that's a pretty great thing. Disney even agreed to delay the film from this summer all the way to December to give the team more time to get everything right. So my main takeaway is this. I think it's okay to be excited about a Star Wars film again. (laughs) 